Hey there, it's Casey Dimon here at TaxSellAcademy.com. Thank you for joining me as I record this week's episode of the Tax Sell Podcast. As always, if you enjoy podcasts, check us out on your favorite podcasting platform. You can find us there by going to TaxSellPodcast.com. Let's go ahead, switch on over, record the audio podcast right now. Welcome to the Tax Sell Podcast, where tax sell investing is made easy. My name is Casey Denman. I'm a tax sell veteran. I am the leading tax sell expert. I'm the author of the Tax Sell Playbook, a founder of the Tax Sell Academy, and I am your host right here on the Tax Sell Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me on today's episode. This is a completely free podcast brought to you by the Tax Sell Academy. So one of the questions that I'm asked on a very regular basis is what type of due diligence should I perform for tax sell properties? It sounds like a very simple question, right? The issue is I actually tend to struggle to answer this question in a way that will satisfy the folks that seem to ask it the most. In other words, I can't provide the answer that they are looking for. Now, I'll be going over a few things later in this episode, but what due diligence is is a very difficult question to answer, believe it or not. Sounds odd, right? The tax sell guy can't provide the answer as to what type of due diligence do I perform. The problem is that I'm often asked this in a way that asks for a do this, do that, give me five things, provide a one sentence answer or shoot a quick five minute video so I can learn about everything I need to do in a short matter of time. They ask it in that type of manner and I simply cannot answer it that way. The reality is that due diligence is the core of what we do. It is a large portion of our business. In fact, it is the majority of our business. Due diligence for a property and due diligence as an investment is everything. Inside the Taxel Academy, I have two entire modules on diligence and research, along with dozens of other trainings and workshops. I have hours and hours and hours on teaching my academy members how to perform the proper due diligence. It's such an important topic that truly can't be broken down into a five minute video, a 10 minute podcast, or anything else as simplistic as some people want it. It is an entire academy by itself. So hear me out. If you want the answer to that question, if you want to know what type of due diligence I perform on tax sell properties, here's the answer. Your due diligence should be to know everything possible about every single property that you are investing in. That's it. That's the simple version. Know everything possible about the property and you cannot go wrong. Of course, then the follow-up question comes, well, what is everything? It is everything, know everything possible about that property. Then you'll never have any issues whatsoever. I can assure you that. But the issue here when knowing everything about the property is there are plenty of times where it's simply not possible. Whether this is caused by something that stops us from accessing certain public records we want, or maybe it's simply a matter of time. We don't have the available time to properly research every single property. Or maybe it's a number of other factors. But it's not possible to know everything about every single property that we research. Or is it? The truth is that diligence also varies between investors. The investor who buys the home with the intention to go in and completely gut and remodel everything, they won't nearly be as concerned about the interior condition as the investor who prefers just cosmetic only upgrades. Or the investor who has substantial capital might not be concerned with potential issues compared to the investor who is investing their very last dime. Likewise, the investor who has experience dealing with certain issues, might not be too worried about those issues. Certainly not as much as the new investor should be worried about those same issues. We can also apply the same concept of due diligence variables to different areas. Some areas are extremely investor friendly. In other words, you don't need to worry about too many issues from the local governments. While other areas 
can be very difficult to invest in where you have to worry about every single little issue. Obviously, this is going to lead to a different type of diligence. So let's go over just a few things to consider when performing due diligence. Now, I want you to know, this is not a complete list. And the details that I go into on each one of these is not a complete description of what to look for. This is not intended to be your five or 10 minute episode to teach you everything you could possibly learn about tax sell due diligence. Because again, we simply cannot do that. We can't teach you in a very short time frame how to perform due diligence. So instead, I'm recording this episode to help you start thinking in terms of what you really need to research and just how deep you need to go. I'll be going over a number of things in rather quick fashion, so make sure you pay attention. All right, let's talk about land first. Vacant land should be a fairly simple investment, right? Well, there can certainly be some issues with vacant land. Size, that's gonna be one of the biggest issues. What's the size of the land? There are a lot, and I mean thousands of properties that are sold every single year that are leftover parcels from developments, that are cut off from parent parcels, that are easements, right-of-ways, or otherwise very tiny parcels of land that are usually worthless. Just because you see a $20 piece of land does not mean you should buy it. While checking the size, we also are not just looking at the total area, the total square footage, or the total acreage of a piece of property. We also need to take a look at the dimensions of that property. A one-acre property might sound appealing until you realize it's 10 feet wide by 4,356 feet long and was originally intended to be a long sidewalk that was never put in. Now, on those same lines, what's the shape of the property? I've seen some rather large properties with such odd shapes that they were virtually not usable. So make sure you take a peek at the GIS. Access is going to be another factor to take a look at. First one, can you legally access the property? If a property is landlocked without a very specific strategy, then it's likely going to be worthless to you. And there are plenty of landlocked property to go around at tax sales. The second question is, maybe it is legally accessible, but is it physically accessible? Although appearing on plat maps, there are plenty of roads that were never developed. The road that exists on a plat map is nothing more than a bunch of woods in real life. Other roads might be washed out or such sugar sand that the property cannot be accessed by a vehicle. What about buildability? Can you legally build on that property? I commonly see areas that are designated as green spaces, conservation areas, parks, easements, water retention areas, and many other similar classifications that are sold at tax sales, yet they obviously are not buildable. The last remaining parcel in that very established nice subdivision that's available at a tax sale for virtually nothing it might just be there for a reason. So be sure to check the land use and zoning to make sure that they allow building and conform to the surrounding areas. What about topography? In Florida, it's not uncommon to see properties that are underwater, swampland, or otherwise wet. In other parts of the country, that one acre parcel, well, it might be on this side of a mountain. I've seen plenty of parcels that are 10, 15 acres that look great online only to realize they consist of nothing more than a cliff and you cannot stand on that parcel. So make sure you take a look at the topography of the property. So if everything checks out so far, what about water? What about sewer? Is water available? Is sewer available? If so, are there any tap-in costs? Sometimes the tap-in cost can make it cost prohibited to build there. What about water? Maybe it doesn't run directly in front of the property, but is it nearby? In some situations, you might actually be forced to pay for the extension of those water or sewer lines from wherever they end to your property. And again, that can be cost prohibitive to build. If water and sewer is not available, can you install a well and a septic tank? Most areas have distance requirements between the two, so make sure that your property meets these requirements. If everything is good so far, 
Will that property even pass a perk test allowing you to install that septic tank? If not, that's gonna be a considerable expense there if you're able to do it at all. What about a water well? Can one be installed? In some areas, you have to go very, very deep and that's gonna cost somebody a lot of money and obviously it's gonna impact the value of your investment. How about liens or code violations? Just because a property is vacant does not mean there are no issues to worry about when it comes to the city or the county. Trash dumped on the property, weed ordinances, snow clearing, and many other things pop into my mind because I have dealt with all of them on vacant land. Check for liens and then check for what you are expected to do as a property owner in that area. And the last one, what about contamination? Is the property contaminated? Check county records, use common sense, dig deep into that property. That corner parcel in the middle of town, well, it might've had an old gas station on it and the contamination from those old gas tanks is now your problem. So make sure you take a deep look into it to make sure it's not contaminated. All right, let's talk about building some. You obviously need to research everything we just discussed and much more. So what's the condition of that building and how does it relate to your strategy? Since we can't access the interior in 99.9% .9 of tax defaulted properties, we should always assume a property has a very, very poor interior condition while doing our best to judge the exterior condition based on what we can see. We also must check the records for the building, including permits, age, history, all that kind of stuff. And when we do, it's probably a good idea to compare that information with what we can see that exists today. It is not uncommon to see a building with unpermitted additions, which could cost you money in the long run. Or even worse, I've even seen buildings that were missing entire sections. I've seen a house literally with the back half of the house just missing because of a fire, foundation issues, all sorts of crazy stuff happens with a lot of tax sale properties. Along with this, we also have to look into code enforcement records. If the property is condemned, that's gonna be an issue. Is the property on the demolition list? That's probably something you wanna avoid as well. Just because something looks pretty from the street does not mean that it isn't on the county or city's watch list because of a bad foundation, because of fire damage on the inside or other potentially hazard issues that you might not be able to see. So be sure to review the code enforcement list, any list that they have, condemnation list, demolition list, violation list, for everything related to your property. What about the foundation? What does that look like? Is it sagging? Are the walls sagging? Or are they rigid like they should be? A house with an obvious sagging foundation, with leaning walls, with collapsing roofs, or other visible issues, that's gonna be a house that's expensive to repair and potentially comes with some major liability issues for the tax sale investor. Now, outside of the physical attributes, there are a number of different things to look at. Obviously, you wanna be sure that you search for the liens against that property. Are there any county or city or otherwise governmental liens? If so, you're gonna be responsible for those. What about IRS liens? Although rare, that could cost you an extra 120 days waiting for them to clear off your property. What about the maintenance requirements? Some cities are very, very strict. Make sure you dig into their county code and their county ordinances. A lot of these places are very strict, especially when it comes to out-of-town investors. I've told plenty of stories before, but I've had situations where an inspector would drive by one of my investments that had a broken window, and he would write me a citation every single day until I replaced that window. So be sure to dig deep into what your responsibilities are there as a property owner. On that same token, what are the other laws that could apply to you? For instance, some cities might require an inspection every time a building is sold. And if you don't get the inspection, they'll start issuing daily fines. Others might have a moratorium on new rentals affecting your ability to rent the property or to market that property as an investment property for a landlord. Every area is different. And if you don't play by their rules, you're going to put yourself into a tight spot sooner or later. They will find out at some point. Then obviously, 
We also need to think about selling the property. That is part of our due diligence. The most important aspect here is going to be the value. What's the property worth? And based on that number, what should I bid for that property? I am always, always ultra conservative with every value that I place on every single property. And then I also go in with a super low bid amount. That way, worst case scenario, I can still make money. You should be able to get to the point sooner or later where you can look at a property and without much further research say, this is the fair market value for the property. This is what I will pay for the property. And this is what I should make off that property. Now, that's not going to come right away, but through experience, through your research, through your knowledge, basically just through going through the process of valuing properties over and over, you'll become comfortable and confident placing values on properties in a very, very quick manner. Become a valuation expert in the area that you're investing in, and it'll make your life much easier. Along that same token is supply and demand. If you paid 500 bucks for a property that's worth 5,000, that's great and all, but if you cannot sell it, if there are no buyers for that property, was it really that good of a deal after all? This happened to me before. I bought a large acreage piece. I walked out of that auction and I knew I'd gotten a phenomenal deal. I probably got it for less than 5% of market value, just a phenomenal deal. I called a few local realtors and each one of them said, hey, great buy, but guess what? There simply aren't any buyers for properties like that in this area. It's probably going to take you five, six years to sell. Obviously, that hurt just a little bit. There are also a number of subdivisions specifically that have thousands and thousands of undeveloped, very rural lots that pop up at tax sales on a very regular basis. Now, you might be able to get them cheap, but can you sell them? That is your question. Your due diligence must include supply and demand. And the last one is your strategy. Does the property fit your strategy? Buying a property that you want to sell within a week might require a different approach when it comes to due diligence compared to that property that you want to hold on to as a rental or you don't mind it sitting on the market for a long period of time before selling. Likewise, if you're investing from across the country, then you'll probably want to approach your diligence different than the investor who's investing locally. Be sure that it fits your specific investment strategies and angles. So as you can likely tell by now, there is a lot to tax sale due diligence. I highly suggest that you get the proper training, that you educate yourself by researching, analyzing, and practicing prior to investing your hard-earned money. Again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, in short, if you want to know what tax sell due diligence is, it is knowing everything possible about the property that you are investing in as an investment based on your specific investment objectives. Hopefully this episode has enlightened you just a little bit with all that goes into performing due diligence on a tax sell property. I think everybody at some point or another is probably guilty of investing in something without truly knowing everything possible about it. And while we might be able to luck out once in a while, at the end of the day, the safest, most secure way to invest is by knowing everything about what you are investing in. Thank you so much for joining me today. If this episode or any of our episodes on the Tax Sell Podcast have helped you, please take just a second out of your day to leave us some positive feedback on whatever podcasting platform you are listening to us on right now. It truly means a great deal to us when we see those positive reviews have been left, and I'm so thankful for each and every one of you who have taken the time to do so already. And if we can be of any additional help, be sure to check out all the links in today's show notes, including one to our primary site, at TaxCellAcademy.com. Take care and make it a successful day. We'll see you next time right here on the Tax Cell Podcast.